we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Rex Holbein. Rex Holbein is a practicing architect in Seattle, working as the principal of Rex Holbein Architects since 1987. In 2011, he began the Facebook community page Homeless in Seattle as a photo journal project to build community awareness for those living without shelter and other basic needs. The Homeless in Seattle site currently has nearly 11,000 followers representing 45 countries, and it is a project under the nonprofit Facing Homelessness, of which Rex is the founding and current executive director. Rex, thanks for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thank you for having me. So start out, tell us, um, when did you first become involved with the issue of homelessness? Uh, well, uh, about uh, five years ago, I moved my architecture office to the Fremont neighborhood in Seattle. And um, shortly after, I started to go down to the bench uh, on the canal. My office is uh, along the Burke Gilman Trail, along the Ship Canal. And at the bench, there are a lot of folks that are homeless. Some are there just visiting for the day. Others are actually spending the night on the bench. It has a small roof cover there. And uh, I would uh, go down for lunches and maybe early morning coffee and, and hang out. And I just started to get to know some of the folks. Um, about three years ago, um, so this is about a year and a half of doing that, about three years ago, I um, was coming in on my, on my bicycle on the Burke Gilman to my office and I noticed there, was a, there were two carts parked out in front of my office and they were stuffed full of art supplies and paintings and on the bottom shelf there was a man sleeping. And I, I got off my bike and I, I tapped him on the shoulder, he was under a blanket and I said, hey, when you get up and if you'd like you can come to my office for a cup of tea. And um, to make a long story short, he came in. Uh, you know, an hour or so later, introduced himself as Chiaka, and uh, we sat, had a cup of tea, and he he uh, asked me if I wanted to hear a children's book story that he was writing, and I said sure, and and you know, he pulled out about 25 pages of crumpled new of notebook paper, and and I thought to myself, oh my God, I'm I'm going to be here for I'm going to be here for an hour listening to this, and but as he as he started in, he was he was uh, less reading it and more performing it. He was singing parts of it. Um, at one point, he got up and danced uh, a portion of it, and about three quarters of the way through, I started to tear up, and and then he started crying, and I started to cry, and you know there was this beautiful moment where two strangers were uh, having this intimate connection, and when he finished, I I just blurted out to him, you know, do you want to keep your art supplies and your um, your art work in my shed outside, and and you know he was all excited about that, and I. I, and then I said what I really wanted to say, which was, and do you want to sleep there? And um, so he went out to the shed, cleaned it all up, and um, uh, when I left that, at the end of the day, you know, he had his whole little home made. Um, so in the morning, he showed up uh, with some artwork, and I realized at that point that he was really this brilliant artist, and he shared to me how he had been so frustrated over the last 10 years of doing art and being homeless on the streets of Seattle, um, that he couldn't sell things really, and he was giving them away for ten, fifteen dollars for food, for art supplies. And in that moment, I just said, "Why don't I start a, a, a Facebook page for you? We'll call it Chiaka. We can try to get some commissions, some sales for you. Just get a following." And so that's what we did for about three and a half months, until one morning when I came into the office, turned on the computer, looked on the Chiaka site, and there was a comment by a young woman from Pittsburgh, an 18-year-old woman, who said, uh, oh my God, I think we've just found our father. And then a 17-year-old woman, her sister, writes, it is our dad. And then Chiaka's mom and all his sisters, all on the site, pleading for him to come home, um, telling him that they love him. And I'm reading this, I'm just uh, struck by it all. And at that moment, Chiaka walks in the door, and I say to him, you know, you, you got to read this. And uh, so I read it out loud actually to him and I turn around and he's streaming tears and he just says to me, I have to go home. So um, he takes me to Fred Meyer, gives me this royal dinner with all his food stamps. He spends the night at, at our house and at 4.30 in the morning I drive him to SeaTac and say goodbye to somebody that four months ago I had just met, uh, someone that was homeless and had become this dear, dear friend. And um, I'm driving home from SeaTac back to my office, and I'm just bawling, you know, I'm just really profoundly 
touched by what had happened uh, over that time. And what I realized is that this man had blown apart for me the negative stereotype against homelessness. You know, his, his kindness, um, his, his genuine kind of genius artistic talent, and also his struggles. He, he left his children when they were seven and eight because of all his mental health issues. He's bipolar. Uh, he has uh, anger management issues, si sincere, deep depression. And uh, he was afraid that he was going to negatively impact his children, and he just left. Um, but I got to see him navigate through that in a beautiful way, and it, it really opened his humanity to me. And um, it was in that moment that I realized that the negative stereotype not only was inaccurate, it also uh, it was debilitating. You know, it was debilitating to people that are living on the street. It's debilitating to our compassion, our collective compassion as community, and, and it's debilitating to bringing us together as community. And it was in that, at that point that I decided um, three years ago that I would start another Facebook site called Homeless in Seattle. And um, uh, that has, you know, moved from early simple photographs and a few comments to a, to a community that has rallied around people that are living on the street. Um, there are nearly 11,000, as you mentioned, people following it. And over the three years, um, every single request that I've made for anybody that has come into the office living on the street has been met by this community. It's been, it's been quite, uh, quite remarkable to me. So one of the things that I've actually learned about this, which I didn't understand starting off, is that there are these two worlds uh, coexisting side by side, uh, but unaware of each other, really. One world is uh, a group of people that are living homeless, and they have these needs. They have needs for tents and they, sleeping bags and sh basic needs, shelter and food and clothing and such. But what they really need is friendship. And uh, the other world, right next to it, are the, is the world of people living in homes who can provide these things, can provide uh, sleeping bags and tents and, and clothing and uh, bus passes and, and such. But what they also really want to provide and need is friendship. And so you have these two worlds that, that have very different abilities, uh, but at the core still want connection and friendship. And, and that's one of the things that has been most beautiful about the homeless in Seattle community is that there is this uh, meeting up and these, uh, these friendships that are being made um, between people living outside and people living inside that, that honestly one, one by one are, uh, is dismantling the negative stereotype. And so you have opened up your office space, your architectural office space for this? I have, and um, uh, you know, it's a little bit like if you open the door to a tidal wave, it's coming in. And, and uh, if you tell somebody on the street that they can use um, your bathroom, for instance, something that simple, word spreads very quickly, and pretty soon you have everybody that's living outside that wants to use your bathroom and and then when they find out that there's also coffee and tea and in the winter um, a place to get out of the rain and and um, and maybe uh, just a place to sit and read books you know uh, during the day um, there's a there's a gentleman that I met that uh, um, lived about he's in housing now he's in DESC housing in Columbia City his name's Darwin but he, he was chronically homeless and he lived about two blocks from my office in a little tiny doorway cut out about three feet deep and six feet wide and um, he came to my office one morning about 7 30 the, the rain was just coming down and he was sopping wet uh, he had been raining all night and he he was just drenched and he asked me if he could just sit by the heater and by the window and uh, so he stayed there all day basically and about uh, oh I don't know four o'clock he stood up and he said to me hey I want to just thank you for letting me be inside today. And as I stood up and I'm seeing the rain coming down, I'm thinking, you know, right, of course, it's, it's nasty as can be out there. And he, it's like he reads my mind. He says, you know, it's not because it's so wet outside all day. It's, it's actually because today I got to be a part of something normal. And, uh, and uh, he went on to explain that, um, you know, he... He got to listen to me have these normal conversations all day long on the phone, that a client came in and talked architecture with me, had this 
normal kind of back and forth. Um, even the small things he said, like the UPS delivery man coming in and having me sign for a package and then him genuinely saying, have a nice day, right? This was, this was all stuff that he got to be a part of. And, he, and then he shared that even though people that are uh, living outside homeless, it may appear that they are mingling with all of everybody else with, with uh, walking down the sidewalk or, or on the bus, on a bench somewhere, that in fact, they are not mingling. They are separated out by this giant plexiglass divider. And uh, the only people that they really get to talk to are people also living non-normal lives on this other side of the plexiglass divider. And this was really an important insight for me because it made me realize that unintentionally when we walk past somebody that is on the street homeless, and, and we do this, I think, to no fault of our own, we, you know, uh, the issue of homelessness is, a, is a, an amazing, giant, complex issue that overwhelms us. And um, in that moment of walking past somebody when you have 10 minutes to get to your meeting or, or your, your head is full of all the other worries and thoughts that you have, it's very difficult to stop your life and say, wow, can I, what can I do for you? What can I help with? And, um, but unintentionally in that moment, we are making our own little 12 inch by 12 inch tile of plexiglass and we're, we're putting it in that giant wall. And uh, so whether we know it or not, you know, we're all a part of this issue. We, um, we're a part of this issue by our actions or our, our inaction. And, and uh, there is, there is um, in my opinion, a, um, something we can do about that. And that is that uh, we can take our one little piece of plexiglass down. We don't have to save anybody. We don't have to fix anybody. But we can, we can just reach out and say hello. We can give a smile. We can make eye contact. We can see their humanity. We can give them dignity by saying, I see you suffering, and I'm, I feel, I really feel for you. You know, my heart goes out to you. I can't do anything for you right now, but I want you to know that I see you. You know, you're visible, right? And um, if, you, if you do that, um, perhaps to somebody that is sitting on the sidewalk on your way to work, and you do that each day, I, I can guarantee you after 10 times of saying hello, you, you know, uh, your own human spirit's going to ask, what's your name? You know? And pretty soon you'll be going by saying, hey, John, and maybe you'll be running by one morning to catch the bus, but you'll still be screaming, hey, hope you're having a good day, right? So, so it starts, and maybe that's all it'll ever be, but also maybe you'll find your best friend. So. so I was initially pulled into your, your Facebook site, Homeless in Seattle. Um, I think probably somebody else clicked on it. And you have these amazing photos, which led me to believe, well, clearly the guy behind the camera is a professional photojournalist. Um, so what's, what is your your focus on that and do you have a background in photography? I, I actually don't. Um, my dad was uh, an amateur photographer. He was an attorney here in Seattle and um, uh, so I grew up working in the darkroom and maybe there I, I uh, gained an appreciation for photography. I certainly, all of the photographs are black and white and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that influence is from my father. Um, as an architect I love black and white Photography, color is very distracting to me. Um, it takes you away from composition, you know, and I, and I also think that uh, black and white allows you to see the person, the portrait, the color, you might be drawn to the red sweater, you know, or the yellow hat, um, but black and white, I think it allows you to look at the person more deeply. Um, uh, for me, for me, this, uh, if we want to call it a photojournal project, uh, Homeless in Seattle, for me, one of the profound things that has happened with it as, a, as you know, being the person that's taking the photograph is that it has been this um, magical connector for me to other people. The camera, the camera is this, is a tool and, and it's a connector tool. And I don't know that I would have had um, the ability to, to come to so many people um, with, you know, with my interest to connect with them without the camera. And that's just me personally. But, but the reason it has worked is it goes back to this idea that 
uh, people that are on the street feel invisible. And anything that you can do to make them feel seen, whether that is a just say hello or taking a picture, and I don't mean taking a picture as a tourist. You know, taking a picture um, for me means th the person that I'm taking the picture of wanting the, the photo as much as I want the photo. That there is this mutual connection, this mutual exchange that is going on and, and that that journey of new friendship um, is what's important as opposed to the end result, which is the photo. The photo is just a piece of paper with their image. What, what is really lasting is this connection that, that you get with a person if you take the time to do that. Um, for the person that's homeless, the amazing thing to me that I didn't understand when I started was that uh, the photograph is, is documenting that they're there, that they actually were here on this planet Earth, that they, they exist and that other people are seeing them. Um, I, in my office, I, I have a, a giant wall of four by six images that are all put uh, tight to each other. And the wall is actually a place now that people that come into the office, they bring friends that, that are also living on the street to show their own picture on the wall. And, um, and when the new person comes in, they'll, you know, you can just watch them. They'll be amazed by all the people that they already know. And they'll, you'll hear them say, oh, I know so-and-so. And, oh, there's, there's Johnny and, and Mike. I didn't know Mike is still around. And, and invariably, they'll turn to me and ask for their photo to be taken. And that they're, they, want to be, um, they want to be seen. Uh, you know, it's the, that's the issue of, of this. And that's actually what's compelled me with the photography is, is to... Um, to create that that feeling within the person that I'm meeting. You worked with students on this issue, haven't you? It, I, this is actually I'm currently working with uh, Washington State University. I'm I'm teaching a uh, a grad school class uh, for their um, architecture design uh, uh, department. It started last semester, actually, the previous semester with. Um, uh, another professor there, Taiji Miyasaka, who uh, we, we discussed this idea of involving students with uh, design and the issue of homelessness. And I brought up to him that Seattle had a recent zoning change allowing uh, detached accessory dwelling units in the backyards of folks' uh, properties in residential areas, um, allowing for increased density. And we discussed this idea about uh, homelessness um, and housing. And one of the issues with, with housing, of course, is where do you house people? Uh, and there's a lot of issues with that. There's the NIMBY uh, response, you know, um, you know, literally not in my backyard. We were actually wanting to challenge that direct on. Uh, but, but actually for me, more importantly, is that uh, while tent cities and uh, large buildings that house uh, transitional housing and, and permanent housing for people that are low income and, and housing or homeless, um, is that while those are beautiful and necessary, they are still segregating. They are still saying, let's take all the people that are homeless and put them in a tent city, or let's put them in a building. And, and again, this is a better solution than, a much better solution than allowing people to live on the street, which is, you know, which isn't a word shameful, right? Uh, I mean, that's another conversation, but we as a culture need to really own up to the fact that we're walking past people um, that are not, this is not the issue of homelessness. These are actually about individuals who are suffering. But, but, um, but a, a, in my mind, a much healthier response would be integration, right? And because um, not only for the person that's pulling themselves out of homelessness, but also for, uh, for all of us, right? This, um, this awareness that the negative stereotype, again, is, is punishing to people uh, when when it's inaccurate, it shouldn't be in place. And and if we can house people in our communities, actually in our communities, and we get to know each other, um, you instantly uh, you expose the negative stereotype for being inaccurate, and and you begin this path of healing and bringing us together as community. Um, we know that we know that diversity makes us stronger and and richer and healthier in our life experiences, and. Um, um, you know, we have to reach out past that because we also, at the same time, we seek safety and, and we can create fear and uh, birds of a feather flock together type thing that, that we, we are a little bit afraid of things that are different and we need to push past that. So 
uh, back to your question, I got off track. The, the, the projects then uh, with the students, uh, the first semester we created these backyard uh, transitional houses. One was with uh, Sinan and Rebecca Demerol, uh, their property, and one was with my wife and I, our property. Um, uh, Sinan and Rebecca are in Shoreline and, and we live in Seattle. And so we had this beautiful, uh, you know, uh, set of designs for backyard shelters. And uh, one of the things that just absolutely blew me away was the transition that the students went through. They, they spent a day in my office. We also went meeting people that are homeless. We also went out and met three stars who has lived for three years in his rowboat in the Arboretum uh, under the 520 bridge. He's this avid environmentalist, and he shared all this knowledge and beauty about the environment with the students. They were all just kind of wide-eyed and mouth-open listening. And then we spent two nights at 10 City 3. And um, both this time that we just did this with a, with a new group of students and that time previously, we had meetings afterwards. And uh, truly, both times, uh, you know, it made me tear up to see the transition that these young people were going through, uh, thinking when they came into it that they had an idea about what homelessness was, and leaving, uh, making statements such as, I'll never walk past anybody on the street again in the same way, that I will say hello, that I will reach out, that, you know, that I understand now that, that this is an issue of people coming to homelessness um, because of a reason, you know, not because they choose to be homeless, but because of a reason, that there is some life trauma, some life event that actually created this, and it's real, and that anybody could be in that place, and that when you suddenly are in that place, how your perspective has shifted, you know. Um, and, and the beautiful thing about all that is that these young students are, you know, I believe firmly that they're going to spend the rest of their life uh, engaged with this issue, one way or the other you know, they're going to be involved in it. And that's, that's um, pretty compelling to me. And did they uh, come up with any designs that one can apply to this unique situation? They did. It, part of the, the discussion really uh, is what, what is transitional housing? Um, one of the things that happens for people that move from outdoors to indoors, especially people that are, have been chronically homeless, is that it's not just as simple as moving indoors. I mean, it, it is a, uh, it's a cultural uh, shift. Uh, and, um, and the questions were, for instance, for the first class, you know, how much, how, what, what kind of shelter is, is needed? What's too much? Uh, what's viable? What's, what's the correct response? And, and some students came up with designs that uh, the kitchen uh, and actual gathering spot would be outside under a cover and that their sleeping place and maybe a small sitting place would be indoors. And that, again, being transitional, moving to someone's backyard for a small period of time while they wait to get into permanent housing. And, um, and you know, the, uh, the um, idea of beauty, you know, that architects are obsessed with, you know, uh, as uh, space being beautiful and how it can enrich someone's life, not just if you're a wealthy client, but actually for someone who is going through transitional housing, how to make that beautiful and, and, um, and simple, simple and beautiful at the same time. And the responses that the students came up with, I thought were, you know, they came from their heart, which is a good place to come from and, and leads to good design. So this, this semester, the students, have, we've opened it up a little bit. We've moved it away from transitional housing and ask the students to uh, find out during their their week and their first week and a half what what was needed in in uh, um, and and again this is it's different for every person that they met so the list was pretty long so right now they're in the process of calling it down but what would what would be needed that could make their life um, better and what what design process could the students go through that would uh, it could enrich or, or better the life of someone that's on the street. So um, each of them have come up with these ideas of, um, of design for a small project, like a better backpack, a mobile care unit that could be um, sponsored by uh, maybe a business 
and somebody would, would travel around the city, they would have hygiene products, it would have a uh, ability to plug in your, uh, your um, devices. Um, you know, uh, one project is turning benches into a uh, shelter. This is one of the, one of my pet peeves is, you know, that we do in this city is that we put bars on benches so that people can't lay down, right? As if to say, you know, we don't want you to have any place to lay down even when you don't have a house. And we purposely don't put cover over benches because that would, you know, give somebody a place to lay down and sleep if they were outside. Um, so all of these ideas, you know, the students are engaging in and, and I think they're exciting and, and uh, will become part of our conversation. So just a, a few minutes left. So how can people who are listening get more involved with your projects? Well, one is they can go to the home, the uh, Facebook site, Homeless in Seattle. I would, I would encourage everybody to just, just uh, get on the site, like it, and start commenting, become part of the conversation. Um, I would also encourage you to find your own answer to this issue of homelessness. Um, uh, the answer actually isn't important. The, what's important is that you're finding your answer, that you're involved, that you have an opinion. Bring it up at a dinner table conversation. Bring it up at the coffee shop. What do you think about homelessness? What's your feeling? You know, engage in the conversation. Um, uh, I would say uh, simple things. When you come off the freeway ramp, roll your window down and say hi to the person. I do it every time. I've never been asked for money. And I have my, I don't have a problem with giving money. I know some people do, and that's okay. But just say hi. You will see a transformation in that person's face. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, here's another thing. Buy the Real Change newspaper. Real change is one of the best things going in this city with regards to homelessness. Um, it is empowering for people that are trying to find a way to uh, reinsert and, um, and do something about making a living. Um, uh, I can't say enough good things about real change and Tim Harris and all the people down there working hard to, to make a difference for homelessness. So um, my main message would be get involved. Um, go to our site. Go to our uh, facinghomelessness.org, um, www.facinghomelessness website. Uh, check out our messages there. Um, come by and, and ask how you can volunteer. One of the things that we're doing is uh, we're not giving people projects. We're asking people what they want to do and trying to find, create, nurture within every person their own little tiny project. It could be tiny or big. And um, I could give you, I don't know how much time we have, but we we uh, we have tons of examples of people that are doing beautiful things from high-end uh, salon stylists creating free haircut days along the canal, you know, uh, that are bringing lots of people together in this beautiful day of giving care. Uh, foot massages, back massages, haircuts, washing hair, all that happening uh, by people that are just stepping forward and volunteering and making this connection. All right. Well, with that, we are pretty much out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. I want to thank you so much. I really appreciate it.